Hi, thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Tell me if you don't hear me enough. I'm JM. Uh, I'm data engineer and lead of the internal analytics team at Datadog. Um, in our team, the, our job is to provide data to all the rest of the other teams at the company. And for this, we had to build a pipeline that has to be always modular, scalable, and observable to build a strong internal analytics platform. And to do so, we adopted a specific approach that we call ETTL, and that's what I'm going to present today. So we'll see a little bit of context, so what we do and how. Why ETTL? What were the challenges that we had to face, that we have to face every day, and that we try to solve with this approach? Hopefully, there are some challenges that we share and that you are facing also in your day-to-day -day work. How this design helps us solving them, how we make sure that it keeps solving them over time thanks to monitoring. So what we do and how, quick introduction of what Datadog does, we did it a little bit before. Uh, we are a monitoring platform for cloud scale infrastructure and application. We aggregate from more than 250 technologies uh, for troubleshooting, alerting, graphing. We ingest trillions of data points per day through performance metrics, traces, uh, requests through your systems here. Uh, logs also, and you can correlate all that on one unique platform. And then you can set up some pretty advanced alerting on top of it. So that's for the product, the Datadog product. What my team does is our mission is to provide all the other teams at Datadog with data and analytics to help them answer questions about the product usage, the business, and the operations. The team is composed of data engineers that are going to take care of the data pipeline. And the data is going to be produced. Well, the data analysts are going to use them to build analytics reports for the rest of the company. That's the tools from which we ingest data. Uh, we ingest from more than 40 data sources right now. You might recognize a few logos here from internal databases where other engineering team usually uh, provide us with data extracts. Uh, also marketing tools, sales tools, and as the company is growing, there are more and more teams, more and more tools that are used at Datadog. So this pool of data is always growing. We have always to set up a new integration with new tools. And on the other side of the pipeline, once we ingest all that, the output that we produce has information about the usage of our product and features by our users. Uh, the traffic on our application and the different websites that we own. Sign-up attribution, which is really inter interesting for marketing. What brings sign-up? What influences people to sign up for Datadog? Same thing for revenue. And then we can get performance of marketing efforts thanks to that. Also, the state of the sales pipeline. And finally, data about the cost of our cloud infrastructure. So how we do this? How do we provide this data? Well, from the data source, we have a daily pipeline that runs every night. This pipeline contains workers, Luigi and Spark. I'm going to talk a little bit more about, it, about them in detail after. Luigi is going to work on virtual machines, CC2, and Spark, as you may know, is running on EMR, Elastic Map Produce clusters, which are a bunch of EC2 instances, actually. We have a pretty neat tool, a platform, that we use, that all the data engineering teams at Datadog use to manage these ecosystems. It's going to run the Luigi jobs and Spark jobs uh, on the VMs, uh, spinning up the EMR clusters when uh, Spark job is launched. For data storage, we use inside this pipeline as for all the intermediary steps, S3. But the output of all that is going to be loaded to a data warehouse, which is Redshift. Redshift is a fully managed uh, data warehouse, which is great for working with huge data sets. And on top of Redshift, we plugged a visualization tool, which is Looker. You might know it also. Once we have this output in the data warehouse, how do 
all the teams access this data. Well, first of all, of course, through Looker, they can consume the reports that our team is building for them and that we maintain. They can also dig into the data themselves. Uh, people with SQL skills, they can directly run SQL queries against the Redshift data warehouse. We are also working on pushing data to other systems like Salesforce, Zendesk, or Marketo. Finally, something interesting is that not only we produce data analytics reporting, but other teams, especially engineering teams, can also use our data directly from S3 to create new features on the data product itself, which is pretty cool. And that's because the structure of our pipeline that I'm going to present creates a very nice interface with our data at different stages of its transformation. All right, now you got all the context you need. So why ETTL? What are the challenges and requirements that we had to face and that we had to tackle? You might recognize a few of them and we might share the same challenges. Well, first of all, our data sources are highly diverse in their formats, in the type of data, the tool we ingest from. They are always evolving and there is a constant need. We get a ton of requests to add a new data source every week. Then working with data, backfilling is really important, as you know, so it has to be very easy to do. We are aiming for long-term persistence. Then as the company is growing, there are different levels of sensitivity in the data and in the permissioning that different people has to access this data. Finally, the pipeline and the data itself has to be reliable and robust. And facing these challenges with a traditional approach of ETL, well, can become a nightmare. First of all, the data sources that are always evolving means that every time you need to change and tweak the whole pipeline, there is a lower resilience to changes in the data source itself if your systems uh, doesn't have a versioning and the data there is always evolving, well, if you don't extract it every day, you cannot go back in time and say, show me the state of the data a year ago. Then cleaning and transformation can be duplicated. Uh, parameterized function can live in a giant utils file. If one test fails, the whole pipeline is going to fail and backfilling can take forever. Then managing the dependencies between the different tasks can be a nightmare and data, data ops can be very complex. So we came up with a new approach that we call ETTL. So what do I mean by that? So the double T is for tier transform step. So a traditional uh, approach of ETL is extracting, do a bunch of transformation with a transform step, and then load the output to your data warehouse. Well here, the transform step is going to be segmented into three tiers. So from the data source, we're going to have the first tier, which is bronze, then the second one that we call silver, and the last one, you can guess, is going to be gold. And then the output is going to be loaded into the data warehouse. So what's going to happen here is that we are going to persist the data at various point points in the pipeline, and that's going to allow us to tackle the different tra challenges that I presented right before. So what are bronze, silver, and gold? Bronze, we're going to simply extract from the data source and put the data in a land that we control, that we own, and we know what's happening there. So we're going to extract this data and put it in the bronze S3 bucket. Here, we're going to simply bring the data in of all the different tools, all the different systems in one place. And again, it's a raw extract, so no transformation is happening, no renaming, no filtering. And the data is going to end up in bronze in a structured tabular format. So we extract once, and then the cool thing with that is that we don't care what's happening after in the source because we, we have the data. Bronze is going to persist it. And we can always go back to this layer and re everything from it if something goes wrong downstream in the pipeline. A concrete example, if you have this in your data source in bronze, no transformation is going to be exactly the same in the bronze S3 bucket. Then silver. Silver, between bronze and silver, there is going to be a one-to-one -one mapping between the objects. So each object in bronze that we extracted from a data source is going to have its corresponding object in silver. What's happening in silver? 
we're going to keep only the column that we need to work with after. We're going to rename them with relevant names uh, and cast to the right type. We're going to take care also of the schema evolutions of the column changing. So, for example, you have starting from this date, this column is ap appearing from this other date. This column actually changed its name. So, we are taking care of all this evolution from bronze to silver. And here we're going to apply all the shared grooming. And this is going to happen in massive parallel because this cleaning is going to, between all the objects between bronze and silver, is going to happen at the same time. So that's highly efficient and fast. What I mean by shared grooming is that we're going to apply all the, feature, the filters, the data cleaning, and the simple role level operation, or the deduping also, that needs to happen before the data is ready to be used downstream in the pipeline. And each object in silver actually is likely to be used by multiple tasks downstream. So this cleaning here is happening only once, and then we will use the object. Concrete example, we had this in bronze. In silver, we're going to have cache casting to the right tab. It's an integer, uh, giving relevant naming, applying raw level, simple raw level transformations, uh, the timestamp are going to end up in the right format, and so on. Then gold. Again, we are going to load into the S3 bucket that's dedicated to gold. So here gold is the analytics layer. That's where we are going to implement all the business logic. And since these transformations are pretty heavy, that's where we're going to use Spark. Here the output is going to be the final objects that will then be loaded into the data warehouse. In concrete example again, you had different objects in silver. Here we're going to do all the heavy lifting, the joins, the big business logic, and for example, we're going to create the new columns that require us to implement heavy transformations. Once we have our objects that are ready to be used, we simply load them into the data warehouse, Redshift. Something to note is that how we are going to load into the data warehouse is going to highly depend on the nature of the object. If your object is just attributes about an entity like your customers, and you care only about the most recent state of the data, well, every day we're going to simply truncate the table and reinsert the most recent data. If it's daily activity, well, in that case, it's going to be an insert or sometimes an absurd to avoid duplicates. So a recap. Between the data source and the load to the data warehouse, we have three tiers. The first one is bronze. That's the data gathering steps. We get the data, we don't apply any transformation, and then we own this data. Silver, that's the normalization layer. Here, we know that all the objects are clean and ready to be used downstreams one-to-one -one mapping between bronze and silver between the objects. And finally, gold. That's the analytics layer. Here, the dependencies can be much more complex. Much more complex because right now, for example, our pipeline contains 370 different tasks. And each task can have, have up to 30 dependencies. So it's going to require 30 other tasks to run before it's able to run itself. So to avoid to have a spaghetti plate to manage manually, we use Luigi. That's kind of the orchestra maestro for us. Luigi is an open source project originally created at Spotify, and it's going to hold all the logic between the different tasks and chain them together based on the dependency graphs that you're going to create. Who is using Luigi here? OK, a few. Yeah, quite a few people. This is the structure of a basic Luigi job. You can see it like a cron job, but in Python. Different sections are going to be like the parameters that you're going to use in your job. Then the most important thing is the require section. That's where you're going to say which task this Luigi job or task is going to depend on, which one is going to require to run before it's able to run. Then the task logic itself, and then simply where the output is going to be written in S3 here most of the time for us. But for this require step, the Luigi framework provided by this tool is already powerful, but it was not powerful enough for us 
to manage the complex dependencies between our different objects. So we took this powerful framework and we simply extended it. Because, for example, let's take these uh, page view objects that we have in gold. You might think that it's simply going to require the page views of today in silver and its corresponding object in bronze. But actually, it's not just this. Maybe we are going to enrich it with some user information. And for this, we want the most recent data. And then we want to add some use product usage rollup and with a three days window. Then this gold object is going to require another gold object with some page categories of today data. That's going to require the whole history of page attributes in silver. And then the corresponding bronze object. So it can get very complex. And thanks to the abstraction that we created by extending the framework provided by Luigi, we're able to simply code all this very easily. The, the extension of this framework doesn't stop only in the dependencies between the task. We also created some level of abstraction to be able to easily add new data sources. We ingest from different tools, like I said. It can be S3 for product usage data, or marketing data is going to live maybe in Google Spreadsheet and sales pipeline data in Salesforce. Well, we're going to have one extract-based task for each one of these objects. And the inputs are going to be simply parameters. So every time we need to add a new S3 path, a new Google Spreadsheet ID, or a new Salesforce object, we just reuse the same task with different parameters. You might be wondering how we code all this. How, what's our development process? Well, in our team, each developer is going to share the same pool of data in bronze because that's simply the raw extract that we work with. But then, starting from silver, each developer is going to have his own mini version of the pipeline. So each developer is going to have his own S3 folder where when it's coding on staging, it's going to write to this folder for each person. Then same thing in gold. And also even we want to be able to test the full pipeline. So even when loading to the data warehouse, each developer is going to have his own version of the tables. That way, we are able to work the whole pipeline test everything properly, and once it's ready for prime time, we just merge it into the prod pipeline. And while developing, we work with small data sets, which allows us to work with smaller clusters, which is cost efficient. All right, so you know what the ETTL design looks like, but how does it solve the challenges that are presented in the beginning? First of all, the data sources, if you remember, they are highly diverse, always evolving, and we always need to add new ones. Well, like I just said, we have one base task per data source in bronze, so it's really easy for us to add new objects that we ingest in our pipeline. Of course, if we need to develop a new API extract with a new tool, it takes a little bit more time, but it doesn't happen often. And each object that we are going to extract are going to be completely isolated until silver. But in silver, we know that they are going to end up in a format that's ready to be used and reused downstream in the pipeline. We take care of the column evolution, for example. Then, working with data, I'm sure you have to face this often, backfilling is really important because you might realize, oops, there is a bug downstream in my pipeline, so I need to tweak the logic, fix it, and then I need to re-backfill everything for the past few months. Well, in the meantime, all the teams need the data, so you don't want it to take a week. Well, with this design of ETTL and the different tiers, you can see each tier like a checkpoint. That way, if the logic is wrong, or we have to simply enrich or tweak the logic uh, somewhere, we only need to re-backfill from the tiers that was impacted by this change. For instance, we want to add a new column. Well, bronze, we don't touch it, it's just the raw extract, and then we simply have to re-backfill silver and gold. If we want to tweak the business logic, bronze and silver stay as the same, and we simply need to backfill gold. And sometimes, for some objects, like 
dim table, like snapshots, where you only care about the most recent state of the data, you don't even need to read back. You just tweak the logic, and the next pipeline during the next night is going to simply take care of pulling the most recent data with the new logic. Then we are aiming for long term persistence. A concrete example here that's a real message that we received in our Slack channel last week. So someone from the sales department had a urgent need. They wanted to have an export of two different objects from Salesforce from December 31st, 2017. Here I just removed the name and put a panda profile pig at all. We don't hire panda for now. And well, we are able to do this because even if Salesforce, in Salesforce the data changes in this source, we don't care, we have the whole story in bronze, also in silver. So we can, thanks to that, investigate the state, the historical state of the data at any given point in time. So here, what I just needed to do is to get the extract from December 31st, 2017 in S3, and download it and provide it to this team. That's because the data source is exactly the same as what we have in bronze. And apparently it did the trick. That's not me who works, that's ETTL who works. Well, I work too, but that's another story. And since Bros is really, really important, really crucial, because we can re-backfill everything from it, well, we put in place some safeguards and backups, because also S3 is not always perfectly reliable. And speaking of backups, we have some also in the end tables, in the data warehouse, because that's the object that our end user is going to interact with directly. Then Datadog is growing. We have more and more data that are more or less sensitive. When I'm saying, saying sensitive data, you can think about revenue, costs, but also sales performance data. And different people at Datadog will have different permission to access these sensitive data. How we deal with that? Well, in S3, in the transform step of our pipeline, we have different buckets and roles that can be uh, access through IAM, and then in Redshift we have different schemas. The data is going to be segmented in different schemas in Redshift, and in Looker, different connections are going to be linked to, the, to these different schemas. And then there is a permissioning in Looker. Finally, we want our data pipeline and the data itself to be reliable and robust. Well, Datadog is a monitoring and alerting tool, so we simply use our own product. First of all, the data should be fresh. That means that we need to make sure that our pipeline runs every night. We have set up some alerts. If the pipeline fails, we are alerted directly on Slack or on PagerDuty. Not only we are alerted if the pipeline fails, but we set up also some preventive alerts. And it's going to notify us if the data is missing in the source or improperly formatted. Same thing, we receive the, the notification, and we are able to fix it before the pipeline fails most of the time. Also, we want our pipeline to fail only when it's worth it, so sometimes it's not a big deal. If the data is improperly formatted, there will be just one tweak to apply later. The data engineering team at Datadog also monitor the latency of it, like how old is your data somewhere, like for us in S3. That way, you know that if your pipeline doesn't run, well, the data is getting older and older, and maybe your customers are going to be impacted, so you can have powerful alerts on these two. You can see that every time the pipeline is going to run or your job is going to run, well, the age of the data is going to come back to zero. Then the data should be fresh, but not only, it needs to be accessible. So we monitor our own infrastructure, Redshift and Looker mainly, because that's the two main tools that people are going to interact with to get access to the data. Same thing, we have alerts if some of them are down. We have some dashboard that allows us to correlate the performance metrics from Redshift and from the Looker instance. Not only the data should be accessible, but we don't want people to stay in front of their computer for like 10 minutes before a dashboard loads in Looker or before a SQL query returns. So the data query should be performant. To do so, we want to monitor the performance of the query against Redshift. 
In Redshift, some of them might know, but Redshift provides a feature called workload management that allows you to segment your query based on some attributes. Like who is running the query? Is it your own pipeline? Is it someone via Looker? And we also monitor how much time it takes to load a dashboard on Looker. These data are not available out of the box with just integration between Datadog and these systems. So to do so, we are running custom queries against some internal tables in these tools. And then when, once we get the data from this query, we send them as custom metrics to Datadog. And then we can basically use all the other features like on any other performance metric. Which is nice is that we can define some SLAs and make sure that we respect them. For example, if a table takes more than 20 seconds to be queried, well, we want to tune the system, all the tables, or maybe sometimes at the Redshift cluster level. We don't monitor only our stack, but we monitor the data itself because the data should be always accurate. First of all, we monitor how many data we insert with our pipeline every night. And to do so, we use a feature called anomaly detection. Because we want to make sure that tonight, I'm not going to insert 10 times the number of data that I used to insert yesterday. Because if that happened, I might want to investigate what's wrong. The cool thing with anomaly detection is that it takes into account seasonalities. And it's interesting, for example, when I want to insert data about page views, because I know that during weekends, there are less people visiting our website or our application. It takes into account also trends. Then, to spot inaccuracy in the data, we want to spot missing dates. Like I said, our pipeline runs every day, and we want to make sure that all the objects contain all the data for every day. It's especially useful when we backfill and we have to re-backfill for like the past two years. We want to make sure we didn't miss any date. So for this, we have some queries that runs against our final object into the data warehouse. And then we are going to send events to Datadog. And it's going to be able to alert us if one date is missing for one particular object. Then duplicates. That's a bad thing working with data. Well, we, spot, we try to spot duplicates first directly inside the transform step in gold when our Spark job runs. But since for plenty of objects, it's just loading a subset of the data, we want also to spot duplicates directly in the final tables in Redshift in the data warehouse. Same thing, we have some queries that runs, spot duplicates, send an event to Datadog, and we know exactly which object is impacted by the duplicates. How do we know which object is impacted? Well, we use tags because when you send a metric or an event to Datadog, you can enrich it with some attributes, tags. For example, here's our dashboard and monitor the performance of our queries against Redshift. The nice thing with tags is that we are able to slice and dice the data based on who, which user is running the query. Is it our own pipeline? Is it someone on Looker? Which objects? And you can simply toggle the filters at the top of the dashboard. Then, of course, we investigate logs, especially when the pipeline fails or there is an issue somewhere. So we want to know what's happening. Well, you can also slice and the logs themselves with the tags. That would be here on the left. And for example, we are able to know if the log is just an error or one on info. That's the basic thing. But we know also which, which task I'm looking at which object is related to this. What date? What's the data source? And most importantly, which tier I'm looking at? Again, bronze, silver, gold, or the low to redshift? So, from the data source to the data warehouse, how do we make sure that we tackle the challenges that we have to face? We have a tier transform step with bronze, silver, and gold. And to make sure that it keeps solving the different challenges that we have, we set up some powerful monitoring on top of it. If that interests you, we are hiring. So you can check the job offers on the website and simply swing by our booth or just talk to me during our office hours after.
Thank you very much. Uh, you spoke a little bit about handling sensitive data. Mm -hmm. Do you have an issue where some of your gold sources have column level sensitive fields, but others are not? And if so, how do you handle that? Yeah. Uh, in gold, since it's stored in S3, that will be mainly developer accessing it. Uh, for that, anytime there is sensitive data, we just put it in the sensitive buckets. So, for example, you have, like you said, an object related to sales. If there is one column that allows to know the sales performance of a sales rep, well, that's considered as sensitive data. Especially that in gold, there is the full granularity because it's at the whole object. That's different when it's in Looker, where you can show only aggregated data and not allow people to dig into the data and see at the, the full granularity. For uh, development environments, you said each user gets a copy of the production data. Do you need to obfuscate or clean that data before they get it? Um, no, because our developer in our team have simply access to all the data. But again, usually we don't work with the full story. We just work with a few days of data when coding. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question for the late tier thing. You have gold, brown, silver. Like, um, I'm assuming that's different uh, stage in Luigi's, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so my question is, um, how do you get when you take a guarantee that? How do you make sure your brown data is reliable if there is no out of order or like delayed data when you try to generate silver or gold data? Uh, well, in bronze. Indeed, that's exactly what's in the data source. So if the data source is inaccurate, the inaccuracy will be in bronze too. But then we'll usually spot it in the pipeline later, and we will basically work with the team that provides us the data in the data source to investigate why this accuracy was here. There are two types of inaccuracies. That's one that are created by us, but our pipeline, and there are ones that are just coming from the data source and for which we cannot really do anything besides just working with the other team to fix them. Okay, do you guys have any like a monitoring system to see if any of the raw data has changed and any flag, any maybe invalidate any brown stage results? Uh, we don't have anything advanced for now. No, we don't, but usually people that are consume the data at the output of the pipeline, so people tell us. Like when there is something wrong, we usually know it pretty fast. Final question. Um, so with the tiered approach, obviously, you have a lot of different uh, strongly defined data sets with schemas. Do you guys do anything special to help you manage migrations? Uh, migration to other tools, for example? Uh, migration, schema migrations. Mm, not sure I understand. Do you have any concrete example? Uh, changing columns, changing column types, that kind oh, of yeah. thing. Yeah. Sure. Well, for that, uh, we simply have, like I said, we have to read back the uh, from the silver tier and then the rest of the pipeline. But yeah, when you change a column uh, or you want to add new ones, you have to backfill again. But you usually impact only one subset of the pipeline.